So um, I'll tell you this story, which has some bearing on the message this morning. Uh, it was in the post if you did read the blog, but I'll repeat it quickly here. There's a preacher who was asked to be a supply pastor, step in for another preacher who was out, going to be out for a while. And so, uh, so the preacher that was leaving said, no problem, it's going to be easy. This is a small church. I mean, the pokes are real nice, and, and there, you know, there's only a handful of people that come anymore, so it's going to be easy. You read the scripture, say a couple of prayers, hold a couple of hands, and, and uh, smile a lot, and, and uh, maybe get loud every now and then, and they'll be fine. They'll be fine. They just, you'll, you'll, you'll have a good time, and, and then just do that. And he was going to do this for a couple of Sundays in a row. Well... The first Sunday came up, and the preacher showed up at the little church, and the windows were open, no AC, anything like that. The windows were open, and when he walked in, it was just as his friend had said. There were a half dozen, if that many people gathered there, just sparsely situated around in the, in the little sanctuary, and they kind of looked at him suspiciously, this stranger in town, and, and then, they, uh, then he walked up to the pulpit, and they sat there just waiting to see what he had to say. He looked out, he said, my friends, my true believers... Do you know what it is I'm going to say to you this morning? And they looked at him for a moment. They didn't look at each other. They just stared at him. You know, it was a rhetorical device. He'd follow that up with a statement for sure, but he didn't. He just stood there with this question look on his face, and then they began to look at each other, baffled by such a behavior. And then finally, a couple of them said, well, no, pastor, we have no idea what you're going to say to us this morning. And he said, well, then fine. There's no reason for me to be here. And he stepped down from the pulpit and left. Well, now, the gossip must have gotten about town because the very next week when he showed up to fill the pulpit again, that was now about two-thirds full in that, in that little church. I mean, folks had come around, people that hadn't been to church in a long, long time were showing up, friends and family, because they said they talk about this strange, weird pastor. He's bound to do something bizarre. You ought to come and just see what it is. And sure enough, this place was two-thirds full. He stepped up to the pulpit. Everybody got quiet. He said, my friends, do you, my true believers, do you know what it is that I'm about? to say to you this morning and it's as if they had rehearsed before they got there for they all said in one accord yeah we know exactly what it is you're going to say to us and he said well fine there's no reason for me to be here and so he stepped down from the pulpit the third Sunday, when he stepped in to take over, he was astonished. He could hardly make his way down the side aisle up to the pulpit. The thing was stuffed to the aisles. People were peering in through the open windows on the outside. You could have heard the fly buzz. Well, you did hear the fly buzzing around. That's, it was that quiet. He stepped up to the pulpit, and he said, My friends, my true believers, do you know what it is that I'm about to say to you this morning? And as if they had worked through this the whole week, the left side looked up and said, no, we don't have any idea what you're going to say to us. And then the right responded with, yes, we know exactly what you wish to say to us. To which he said, fine. If the people on my right side will tell the people on my left side, there's no reason for me to be here. <laughs> and he left. I think that's, I use that story because I think that's the interesting sort of predicament that we find ourselves in with the church. I think we find ourselves in this, in this place where we assume we know what we're doing here. We assume we know what you're going to say to us. We assume we're all pretty much of one accord. But the reality is, is we really don't know who we are. And we really have no idea what it is we need to be saying to one another. Instead, we tend to know what we're not. Right? So we had fun with Pastor Spikes Reverend Spikes, and we had fun with uh, the, some of the bluegrass songs and the I'll Fly Away theology of the old gospel church, which is still prominent. I mean, I suppose that song is still sung quite a bit. But, but we know we're not that, perhaps. Or maybe, maybe many of us have decided exactly we know what we are not going to be or what we are not identified with, and yet we don't really know who we are then. And part of that, I think, is, is what we what brings people to the church to begin with. Have, uh, well, you've, I'm sure you've thought about this thoroughly. I'm sure you've worked out dissertations on this matter, wh what it is that brings people to church, right? You know why you started coming to church. And it may be a little bit different in here now that I think about it, but most people, most people come to church because of two primary emotions. One is fear, and the other is a desire to belong, community. Two basic emotions. And interestingly enough, both of them are sort of related to the one, which is basically our fear. 
We need to belong to someone. We need to belong to something. We need to belong to a community. And what happens is, is that we, are, we start doing this thing where we seek like-minded people. We seek like-minded people at church or at work or in our families because we're looking to confirm that sense of familiarity, that folks are like us, that folks think like us. We want to belong, and so we seek those faith communi- communities that sort of think. I mean, I'm thinking of the first people that came in here that hadn't ever been here before for the first time. Maybe their friends said to them, oh, you're going to love this church. They sing all this great classic rock music. They do all this indie music. They walk in and we're singing Constant Sorrow and I'll Fly Away. (laughs) And they've already decided this is the wrong place. Or maybe folks gathered around out in the courtyard, you know, when they hear us singing I'll Fly Away and they're going like, that's an old gospel kind of bluegrass church. Or the other Sundays when they come out here and they hear us singing Led Zeppelin and they go, they're just going to hell. That's all that is. They're just, (laughs) you know, they're just not, um, they're on the wrong track. I mean, people come into church with their minds kind of made up, even if subconsciously we have these ideas that we know what it is we're supposed to be hearing. We know what it is we're supposed to be thinking and so we come to these communities. And the reason for that is, of course, is that we, we respond out of these basic issues of fear. What basically forms the traditions and structures and the foundations of all of these churches, whether they're, whether they're the fundamentalist evangelical or whether they're the progressive left-wing churches, even the Unitarian churches, the end result is that what basically sort of creates the foundations is this notion of fear and the need to belong. And the end result being either on the right side, a defensiveness about doctrine or nationality or creed or school pride. You can just witness how this is in the public. You can witness the furor over what the, what was the, what's the athlete or the the football player's name? The first guy that took a knee when the, hmm? Kaepernick. Kaepernick. Yeah, so you all familiar with the story. It's social media. It's all over the place. And everybody's already lined up on either side of the argument, you know. And even the Time magazine has decided it's enough of a social issue that it's on the cover of this week's Time magazine. As he, there he is kneeling down. Is it free speech? Is he making a statement? and, 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 And then the interesting thing to me is that it's ironic because never mind the fact that the national anthem is kind of strange at a football game in the first place, unless we're thinking Greco-Roman times and we're bringing out lions and we've identified ourselves with the emperor of Rome and then we're going to eat the other players. I mean, there's this sort of, this this patriotism that masks what's really going on for us. And then even think further than that, the irony of complaining about somebody who's practicing the very right that they're complaining about them doing, right? So you read in the article in Free Speech where one of the coaches says, well, I believe in free speech, but not that much free speech. And the same holds true for the whole issue of this ridiculous polarity that we continue to find ourselves around Black Lives Matter and back the blue. As if the greater issue of poverty and classism and racism aren't the real issues we should be dealing with anyway. But that's what that allows us to do. Anytime we're allowed to align ourselves with, a, with, a, with a, a, an opinion or a concept or an abstract, we never really have to deal with reality. And that's where we always go. How easy it is for us to align ourselves on an issue. The real messiness is looking past the issue. And that's the challenge. And that's the challenge of beliefs, too, because beliefs are also couched in these cultural narratives that run deep in our psyche to such point we don't really think about what we're thinking. We just react. We just align. We just feel comfortable. And what basically forms the basis of the smut-plucking communities of the extreme evangelical groups or the social club and family-centric kind of sexy appeal of the other kinds of suburban Protestant churches or the suburban communities are these same kinds of blind beliefs, even those of us in here who are open-minded bring our open-mindedness like it's a badge as opposed to like it's a deep, gnawing question. And that's the challenge. That's the challenge for all of us, is how do we get past even our, belie- even our open-minded belief systems? How do we get past them to actually engage with people around us? The funny thing about beliefs, too, is I want to suggest that I think beliefs sort of are like, I mean, especially a church like, uh, I forgot the name of that church, Jakey, what was the name of that church? Coweta, Baptist Church, yeah. Uh, especially places like Coweta, ba- there is a Coweta, isn't there? 
I think they're, anyway, especially like Coweta Baptist Church. I mean, when you come to a place like that, you know that everybody there knows what they're supposed to believe, right? Because if you don't, you begin to experience that sort of isolation from the community. You begin to feel that kind of separation. And what you realize is that these communities, as rigid as they may still be, that they are still doing good things things for people in the community there's no question they still reach out they still know they're supposed to be charitable you can't ignore the stories in the gospel you can't ignore the black sheep and the uh, the goats and the sheep you can't ignore the story of those feeding the five thousand you can't ignore that story you can't ignore that jesus was about helping the poor and the hungry but you can do it from a distance you can do it from behind the wall of your belief system or your comfort zone and you can feel good about yourself And I don't want to suggest that you shouldn't. What I want to suggest is that sometimes we wear our kindness and our compassion like it's a badge without really opening up to it as a gnawing question that continues to say, are we there yet? Do we really understand? Do we're looking past even what we think to try to open our minds to what we might know or learn? These beliefs, they become kind of like passwords. They kind of become like handshakes, right? So that even when we all go into church, in traditional church, and we say the Nicene Creed, or we say the Apostles' Creed, I believe in the Father, I believe in God the Father, maker of heaven and earth. I'll, I'll, okay, wait a minute. I believe in God the Father, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, uh, our Lord, born of the Virgin Mary. You know this one? Some of you? Born of the Virgin Mary. You can say it with me. It won't, nothing's going to bite you. Born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. Uh, on the third day arose from the grave, ascended into heaven, sit at the right hand of God the Father, from there he should come, judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Catholic Church, the Holy Catholic Community, the communion of saints, the, the resurrection of the body. I mean, we say all of this, right? We say this. It's like a password. It's like the secret code, how you get in. It's like the handshake. And if you say, yeah, but I don't think I really believe in that, then, then all of a sudden you feel this isolation. It scares people. Because we get so anchored to, what, to our beliefs, so anchored to our fears that we can't see past to what's actually there. Even me bringing this up might offend some. And that's not my intention to offend, but it is my intention to try to get you to think past your comfort zones, even as I have to learn to do that every day all the time. We could line up on either side of those creeds if you wanted to really get into the debates, and that's usually what happens, right? When someone says, okay, well, do you believe in the resurrection, Tom? And I'm stuck for a second. I'm like, oh my gosh, what do I do? And then I think, well, yeah, I do, in fact. I do believe in this resurrection. I do believe. I've experienced some of the deepest, darkest lows in all of my life in the, del- in, the, in, the, in the doldrums of depression, in the deep pit of despair. I've experienced that. Our son has been in the, in, the, in, the, in the clasp of death so many times when he was a meth addict and we thought we'd lost him. We thought he was gone. We thought he was dead in different occasions. I've experienced this sense of complete despair. I know families who've had lives ripped apart. I know this idea of, of despair. And yet, I know these things to somehow find ways through like invitations through the challenge like obstacles becoming pathways to a deeper wholeness to a wider understanding and to suddenly see a bigger life a more healed and resonant life a more compassionate life because of those deep dark difficulties and despairs I've seen resurrection and I'd say that and they'd say, yeah, but then, no, no, I'm talking about do you believe Jesus raised from, raised from the dead, that a dead guy came back to life? And I think, well, we just missed it, didn't we? But the curious thing about Jesus is, is that he really didn't talk about these kind of belief systems or creeds or orthodox formulations. He didn't really talk about, in fact, he probably challenged most of the handshakes and the secret passwords. Because that stuff can get pretty mean, can it? It can get pretty violent. It can be pretty shaming and exclusivist and judgmental. But Jesus seemed to be doing something else. Jesus seemed to be moving past all of that, which is why in the Gospel of Luke, I wanted that passage so much. Because there he is, eating with the wrong people, hanging out with the wrong folks, practicing the wrong kinds of lifestyles, doing the wrong things completely, and word's gotten about that this crazy guy is around doing all this stuff, and his family says, we gotta get him. He's gone crazy. And then the leaders come down from the institution, and they say, well, he's, in, he's you know, possessed by Beelzebub. You know, which is, I, I wanted to use that word, Pat, and I know it's a fun word, but 
I liked it better than Satan or something, you know. I like Beelzebub. He's possessed by Beelzebub. I mean, how else would you explain such aberrant and challenging and contrary behavior except to call him insane and possessed? Instead, Jesus didn't talk about beliefs. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, the ones seeking to work together to move past the differences, the ones who build bridges to find common roots and grounds that will open us up to one another. Blessed are those who mourn, the ones who can share with empathetically with others, for they shall find comfort, and the meek who walk humbly in the world, who are less egoistic but more about others. Blessed are the merciful. And then, of course, my favorite at the last, and I'm interpreting it, all right? Blessed are you when folks around you think you have lost your mind (laughs) because of the compassionate, strange life you lead. There's none of this believe in that or believe in this and then you're out if you don't. Instead, not in the synoptics. I mean, there is in John's gospel. There is in John's gospel and we've talked about John's gospel is really that gospel that was written almost 90 years, maybe even 100 years after Jesus' death and it was written with that whole issue of sort of a mystical, transcendent kind of understanding of God. Even some say a little bit of a Gnostic kind of influence but if you think about it, by that point, a whole generation or two after Jesus' life and you've already got communities fighting about who this guy was who this guy is, and they're already lining up. They're already drawing lines, and John's gospel comes out as one of those defining sort of of passwords, some one of those defining sort of ways to think about him so that he can separate, that community can be separate. It's not in the three gospels. The three three early gospels are all about Jesus' life. I have this wonderful quote from from Diana Butler, and I want to finish up with just a couple of thoughts here. So the band can come on up and stand behind me as I say this quote. But Diana Butler Bass has this great quote. She says, "Why is it that the church among why is it that the choice among churches always seems to be the choice between intelligence on ice and ignorance on fire?" Why does that happen? And if you just read the newspaper, if you just read the, this last week's New York Times article about Trump and the, and the right wing, and I'm not trying to, I keep saying I'm not trying to step on Trump. He's just a great example of thinking gone bad. But anyway, <laughs> and I don't mean his thinking, I mean other people's thinking. It's just, it's because there's such alignment with fear that Trump represents a time in the 50s where the whole thing was about keeping out what was frightening by just, you know, cloistering in the wagons, circling the wagons, and keeping it to the way that most white middle-class evangelicals loved it back in that day. That's what basically it is. And here we have the primary example of life led by fear. So all you got to do is scare people, and then you've got hold. The church has been doing it for years. Politicians have been doing it. This is what Brian McLaren says in his book, Jesus, Buddha, Muhammad, and Moses. Oh, it says, why did Jesus, Buddha, Muhammad, and Moses cross the street? The road. Why did they cross the road? <laughs> Linda's book group is doing it right now, and, it, and it's a great book. Um, but it, it, because he deals with this whole thing of how we identify ourselves so concretely as a way of defining ourselves against. It's always against. How about if we define ourselves in relationship? Wouldn't that be interesting? How do we find ourselves as those Christians who are in relationship to anyone and everyone as opposed to against such and such and such and such? And the group, and I have to say this, there was a side, there was a side joke that happened in that class that I thought was hysterical. They said, um, well, so okay, they're all standing at the light. Buddha, Jesus, Muhammad, Moses, they're all standing at the light. What does Jesus do? Is he going to go back and go, you guys are wrong. I'm leaving. I'm out of here. And Jesus turns around and gets to know him, right? Jesus engages with him. Jesus is friendly and kind. And then when it's time to cross the street, Jesus goes, I got to be last. I'm sorry. (laughs) It's just got to be last. And and then, and this was what y'all were saying in the group that I thought was hysterical. And then Moses is going, that's all right. I'm going to part ways here. (laughs) And then Buddha's going like, I think I'm happy right here where I am. I'm just fine. I couldn't think of what Muhammad was going to do. So I, I don't know Islam as well as I should, but but this is what Brian McLaren says. He says, the single greatest obst- obstacle to rethinking Christian identity won't be imposed from the outside by other people, whether it's us or them. And that's important to think about in our political con- you know, set- setting right now, as well as in our social setting, as well as in our church setting, as well as in our own church people with things that are going on right now. 
The single greatest obstacle to rethinking what it means to be a Christian is not going to be imposed from the outside. It's easy to point to the outside. It's easy to say they're the problem. It's easy to say that scares me. But that's not the greatest obstacle. The greatest obstacle is what's inside of us. The greatest obstacle will be in you and me. And in the end, it's not the threats of others that cause me to shrink back, but my own fear. That is the greatest obstacle. So this last thing before, before they start to sing. Last week I told that story about the man from Crete who lets go of the sand. Some of, most of y'all were here and he lets go of the sand and he's, after he's died and he's finally able to walk through the gate of heaven. He was clinging so tightly to the sand of Crete that he couldn't walk through with that, with that in his hand. And he lets go, walks through, and what does he see on the other side of the gate but his island Crete. I learned this story a long time ago from a friend of mine who was an activist and um, and a Christian and and also suffered from cancer and stuff. He had a lot of obstacles in his life, a lot of reasons to be scared. But he told me this little story. He said, you know, there was once a man who lived up a hill. He was like a hermit, lived in a small hut, didn't have much, but he enjoyed everything around him. Every moment came alive. Sunrises, the village below, everything was alive with possibilities. Every person he met, alive with possibilities. One night he was robbed. Robbers came in, took everything he had, kind of beat him up a bit. He didn't have much, so they got really angry. He said, well, I could give you my clothes. That's all I got, the hermit said. So they took even that. Took his clothes, went storming down the night pathway back down the hill. And there was the hermit standing at the top of the hill. And as he was watching him go down, he noticed something. The moon started to rise up over the tree line. And as he, got, as he saw that moon coming up over the tree line, he looked down and he was about to shout, but they were too far away. And he said, my poor friends, if they'd stuck around long enough, I could have given them this view of the moon. Amen.